important whenever we're looking at appraisal values of these particular properties. The main three things that we're looking for to determine whether it is a, a good property to actually go in and do some renovation work to would be how much are you purchasing it for? How much money are you putting into it or how much rehab funds are you putting into that particular property? And what is the expected after repair value? Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Whether you're a longtime listener or a first-time listener, thank you for being back for another episode. The title of today's episode is Investor Loans 101, How to Fund Your Rental and Burr Properties. So this entire episode is going to be a deep dive on how you as an investor can get a loan for both your flip properties or your short-term properties, but also your rental properties. So whether you wanna buy a fixer-upper and turn that into a rental, or whether you wanna buy a turnkey rental that's already fixed up, how do you get the loans for that? Money is so important. And I'm gonna be interviewing two people who are in the trenches giving loans to people every single day. Their names are Christian Grooms and Greg Hugel, and they work with a company called Lima One Capital. And Lima One is actually in the upstate of South Carolina near me, but they're a national lender who works primarily with investors. And so I've partnered with them and I'm really made a bigger goal for my channel to not only educate, but also to offer you some tools that I like. And this is a lender that I vetted and, and think they do a really good job. And we're gonna go into the details of short-term loans. So if you're trying to buy a property and just need to fix it up and do a loan over a short period of time, or whether you wanna do a long-term rental loan, including 30-year fixed loans that are beyond the normal kind of conventional loans, which are also a good option, right? If you can get an FHA, a VA, and move into a property and do a house hack, that's one option. Or if you want to do investor loans and you have a good credit and good income and all that to get a conventional loan. Those are going to be your lowest term, lowest rate options. But what happens when you want to go beyond that? Or what happens when you want to do loans in an LLC or you don't want to um, you know, get cut off at five loans or 10 loans like some of the other investor programs do? This is a, there's a whole other universe of loans out there that honestly weren't there when I first started as an investor. So I'm really excited to share the details of those, what the interest rates look like, what you have to do to qualify, what some of the red flags are, and then give you some examples with Christian and Greg who are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, before we get to the interview, it's time for my weekly behind the scenes segment where I share a short snippet of what's going on with me behind the scenes in my real estate investing, finances, or business. And this week, I actually want to go back in time. So this is something that I'm not doing currently because I'm in a different stage of my business. But early on, when I first started in real estate investing, when I was growing my business the first few years, there was a little trick that I used to use. And it's not a trick necessarily, it's a good practice that I would have a credibility package when I was trying to go get loans or when I was talking to sellers or when I was talking to private lenders. I had this little package that I called my credibility package. And you're gonna be hearing in this interview about lending and a lot of it's about numbers and it's about the property and all that's really important, of course. You need to have a credit score, you need to have a property that produces a certain amount of income in order to qualify. But what I found is when you're doing business with anyone, especially when you're just meeting them, you wanna put your best foot forward. And so my recommendation, what I used to do, is to have this little credibility package put together ahead of time. And at the time, it was like a three ring binder, but you could also have a PDF copy of this that you could email people. And I found that you could put different things in this credibility package, but you wanna put things that make you look good, that show your best, to show you have credibility. So I would have reference letters. When I first started, I didn't have any experience in real estate, but I went to my college professors, I went to my college football coach, I went to people locally that I knew in town who had uh, respectable professions, an attorney that I was working with, my banker, and they would write reference letters saying, Chad, somebody who we've chosen to work with, we think he has good character, he, he follows up on things. It could be very specific, but have some reference letters. And then I would do whatever financials I could prepare ahead of time that the lender is going to ask for anyway. So I know they're going to ask for a financial statement or a schedule of my properties. So having a spreadsheet that showed all my properties. If you could show a business plan, show that you've actually thought about what is your real estate business? What's your plan? How are you planning to, to make money with your rental properties or your flips? It could be a one pager. It's real brief, but here's what I'm doing. Here's my team. Here's how I'm planning on doing this. Here's my strategy that shows that you've thought about your business a little bit more than normal. And then I like really, if you've done some deals already, why, why, why not have some case studies? Like pictures are great. Even bankers who look at numbers would like to see that, hey, here's a property I did six months ago where I fixed it up, 
I did the work. I, here's the ugly property before. Here's what the kitchen looks like now. Here are the numbers. Here's how, what I bought it for. Here's the remodel cost. Here's what happened in the end. Like show that you've done another deal and show the details of that, both visually with the pictures, but also the numbers. Tell that story. So those are just some examples. You could put more stuff in there. I used to put copies of my last, last two years tax returns in there, even if they didn't ask for it, because I just want to show that I'm prepared. They weren't that great. My tax returns weren't very good early on, but I had it. And so I put that all in a neat little package and I would make copies of it. If I talked to a new lender, I'd hand it to them. And I remember one time a lender saying, I've never gotten anything like this before. And here I am at 25 years old, 26 years old, putting that together, giving it to the lender. And he kept it on his shelf. Like he used to show it to other people in the office. Like, look at these guys. They brought this big pack credibility package and they did this ahead of time. And, and so it will make you look better with whoever you're working with, whether you're raising money as a private lender, whether you're working with lenders like this, the, the lender who you talk to, the person you're talking to has to go to bat for you. They have to go talk to underwriters. And if they feel like you have put your best foot forward and you're for real, they're gonna go to bat for you more than they would otherwise. So that's my little tip today behind the scenes. Something I used to do all of the time is have a credibility package and maybe it's something that will help you as well. If you like these behind the scenes segments each week, I wanna invite you to stay in touch with me beyond the podcast by checking out one of the online courses that I offer. Online courses are a way to interact with me and let me help you with your real estate investing. Some courses are available anytime and others like my premier course, Real Estate Deal School, is more of a boot camp style course where you and other students go through live with me as I help you step-by-step -step in purchasing your next investment property. You can get details on all these courses at coachcarson.com forward slash courses. Now let's get started with today's interview. All right, Christian and Greg, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you guys here. Thanks for having us. We uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, yeah, sir. great to talk to you. And you know, what I want this to be, uh, this is going to be a, a really deep dive kind of you know, practical review of investor loans. And so I know a lot of the listeners, some people have done investor loans before, some people are new to this, but I would love, you guys are in the trenches every day giving loans to people, going through the process from beginning to end of investor mortgages. So I really want to pick your brain and understand what's going on right now, today, and the investor mortgages. But I, before we do that, before we get into the nitty gritty stuff, I'd love to get to know both of you a little bit more. I've, I've gotten to know you and know, know your background, but tell us a little bit, Christian, first about, about yourself, how you got into this investor mortgage world, and maybe a little bit about your interest in real estate investing personally, too. Yeah. Um, again, I appreciate you letting us uh, join. Um, so my name is Christian. Um, I'm a senior sales manager at Lima One. I've been with the company going on close to four years now. Um, and I've always had a passion for real estate. Um, didn't really know much about it, but I knew that I had a drive and a passion for it. Um, and, and I stumbled upon this job, uh, you know, a while ago through some mutual friends uh, here in Greenville, South Carolina. And, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on. I, they told me to hire, they were hiring for underwriting. And then I was pushed over to sales based on a, a personality uh, trait that I have, you know, love talking to people, love helping people. Um, and, you know, I've been here for almost four years, as I mentioned, and really seen so many different um, business ideas and the way that people fund all these deals. And, you know, through that, um, as Greg will mention, you know, we have became partners and, you know, more about ourselves uh, personally, like we have now been able to grow um, our personal investment portfolio through looking at all the different types of business models that we see. And, you know, it's, it's great. Um, every day is different, uh, like football. Um, you know, you see so many different things and um, it's not work to us. Uh, we really love it and, you know, thoroughly enjoy it. Cool. Greg, what about you? How'd, how'd you kind of get into this, this side of things? So first off, thank you very much, Chad, for having us both on this, uh, this podcast. Absolute pleasure. Always like to take the opportunity to uh, pour into other investors, just constantly talking about different experiences that uh, each has and uh, being able to gain some, some more knowledge on that to be able to apply it not only in the everyday, but uh, also to help people grow their businesses. So thank you for having us. Um, my name is Greg. And I'm a business development analyst here at Lima One, uh, actually part of Christian's team that he's got going on over here. But uh, the way I got into real estate investing, I've always had a passion in real estate. My, uh, whenever I gr was growing up, my, uh, my dad was constantly doing house projects. And uh, really, that's what I was doing every single weekend. 
Um, so that kind of just, uh, I was learning the day to day and what kind of goes into, uh, increasing the value of particular properties. Um, so that's what my childhood looked like that actually developed a, a profound passion for real estate investing and, um, just more about the industry. I just wanted to constantly learn about it. So met Christian whenever I was in college, we both went to Clemson, played football there together. And, uh, not only was he one of my teammates, but he was one of my best friends and we saw different characteristics in each other that uh, you don't look for in just a friend, but also a business partner. So as Christian mentioned, that's actually what we do now. We, uh, we work together at Lima One, and we also are business partners on the outside for uh, investing in real estate. So kind of construction is, uh, is what got me into real estate in the first place and uh, pairing up with Christian as a business partner and then hopping on over to the lending side of things, learning the, learning the money behind it, the ins and outs of what makes deals work has brought us to where we are now. Yeah, that's really cool. I always tell people like real estate, if you simplify the whole business, it's really about sticks and bricks and money. Like you're just basically putting those two things together. So you had the sticks and bricks background with like fixing up properties on the weekend with your dad. And then you got into the money side, which is it's a great combo. So that's what, so I, I do want to go, you know, people are gonna have to excuse us to, to talk about Clemson football a little bit, but like <laughs> the, the not only are you guys in the upstate of South Carolina, we have we have the Clemson football connection, Christian's where and if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll notice Christian's uh, Clemson Tiger football. Uh, you know, shirt as well. And then, and, and Greg, you know, both you guys were, were kickers on the team. Is that right? Is, I remember, remember that, right? So I know Greg yes, was with the national championship team and in, in 2019, I believe. So yeah, we kind of cool connection there as well. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, Clemson football always leads back to each other somehow is what, what we're always uh, told. And, and here we are today. Um, Greg was um, the All-American, uh, you know, freshman All-American, um, and scored 300 and something points in his freshman season. So that's not me, that's him. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, we're, we're, as Greg mentioned, you know, we came together and, you know, through football became best friends and, and, you know, look at us today. Yeah. It's awesome. Love it. Well, we, we can, we can keep talking football and we'll have another conversation, but just wanted people to know that connection for sure. Everybody sees my football helmet in the background when I'm on YouTube. So they, they kind of, they know what that's all about. Um, but let, let's jump into the investment loans. And I want to kind of precursor this, like before we get, we're going to get into some of the details of different loan programs that you can use for burst strategy, for the straight kind of turnkey rentals, for fix and flip kind of deals. There's all sorts of different programs y'all are going to explain, but maybe Christian, you could just like take us in the higher level. And I, you know, I know people, when they get into investing, it depends on what strategy they're looking at, what kind of loan is a good fit. You know, sometimes there's owner occupant loans like FHA and USDA and VA that people move into a property and get their first time home buyer loans. There's these conforming, you know, mortgages, which are, can be owner occupied and investing. And then there's this whole world of investment mortgages. Maybe you can just take us from a higher level, kind of what the, what the different options are for people considering getting loans for their investment properties. Yeah. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. There are tons of different options. Um, you know, as you mentioned with um, conventional style loans, you know, what a lot of people will do if they're really trying to get into it for the first time um, outside of what we do at Lima One, you know, um, people will buy a duplex or a quad or a triplex and house hack that. Um, and, and they will get that FHA or some loan with three or three and a half percent down and rent the other sides of the property and, and you know, use that rent to cover the mortgage. And you know, so that then leads us to, you know, what we do at Lima One. It's a, it's a totally different market. Um, it has really blown up um, recently. I mean, there's now so many different lenders in this space. And, you know, we're, we're in the private money lending side of things. Um, and, you know, if we're comparing conventional loans to what we do, it's really apples to oranges. And, you know, what we do is we take the common sense underwriting to these loans. And we're an asset-based lender. And what that means is we're, not looking at your W-2 income. We're not looking at your tax returns. You know, we're really looking at the deal as a whole, whether it's a rehab deal on a short-term loan or a rental loan. Um, we're really looking at the asset and, you know, do you qualify as a borrower? Um, and, and the asset is the biggest thing, you know, because we're looking at, can you make this into a good investment? Hence why we all want to make money through real estate investing, but as a lender, we have to underwrite with risk uh, to make sure that, you know, it's a good investment strategy for you as a borrower. 
I think it's kind of an interesting take. Like, you know, I, I like the apples to oranges comparison. You know, I, I, I'm a big advocate. If people can do a, a house act and they get a low interest loan and you know, your lowest interest, your best terms are going to be on an owner occupant loan. Like that's just, that's just the, the facts of the matter, right? Cause it's a lower risk loan for banks. And so getting into that as your first deal or two, like, it's great. Like make, make that happen. But I hear, I hear a lot of people, they kind of get up to a ceiling or maybe they're in a, just a different situation with like, all right, I've done three or four loans conventionally. And I'm kind of hitting some, some roadblocks here where I don't have enough reserves or just the, just the in debt income ratio is not working. So that's when, like when I was in my business, when I first started, I was not even borrowable. Like I just started as an entrepreneur and flipping houses. Mm-hmm. And so I had to go like private loans and seller financing, all sorts of alternatives first. But what, what I really like and the reason I want you guys to come on is if you want to be an investor who kind of scales a little bit, even if you're going to five, six, seven properties or 15 properties or 20 properties, eventually you've got to learn how to like get different kinds of money than just the normal owner occupied or conventional type mortgages. And that's where, like, I think it's a really actually an advantage that you guys underwrite the way you do. Cause I, I remember some of my private lenders would, they, if they didn't do a deal, if they're like, no, I don't really think I want to loan on that deal as a new investor, as a young investor, I should listen to that because like the, the lender is telling me something that is, maybe is wrong with that. So, so let's, let's talk about some of the the loan program specifically that you guys do at Lima One Capital, because it kind of, I think, reflects the different options investors are going to be looking at. And let, let's start with just the, the short-term loan. So let's say somebody is getting into a deal that they're either going to flip, or maybe they have another loan program they want to do, you know, six, 12 months from now. Talk to me about, you know, what those options are for somebody who just needs to knock a deal down, get it done quickly, and ha- how that fits in with like investment strategies. Yeah, so that is that is a great question. So really, it just comes down to the exact type of property. So looking at it from the short term side of things, if you find a property that is distressed, or even then if you find a property to where that just needs cosmetic updates, and you're really just trying to bring it up to market value, because at the end of the day, whenever you're looking at whether that would be a flip, or even a long term rental on the back end, at the end of the day, you want it to be up to market value to where it is the best investment property at that particular time. So what we have is we have bridge options or short term loan options for more on the fix and flip side of things, to where we'll be able to finance part of the acquisition, or a uh, really up to 75%, 80% of the acquisition 85. All of our short term comes down to the experience of that particular borrower. So, and that is exactly how it is with uh, any lender, any lender within the, the private space, uh, within real estate investing. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind is yes, there are lenders out there that are able to finance or do 100% financing, but it all comes down to each individual investor's risk tolerance. That's the biggest thing that investors find out very quickly is how tolerable they are to the amount of risk on each deal. So just to, just to add in there, like if I'm, a, if I'm, I'm someone who's done one house act and I'm not branching out now to do my first flip property, I don't have a lot of experience in that business. I can expect to have more skin in the game, like in terms of like a, a probably a lower loan to value, loan to cost, and maybe uh, different rates and, and costs. Is that accurate to say? Oh, that's hundred percent accurate. You know, so as a, as a lender, in the private lending space, we price our loans based on risk um, and we price them with leverage based on risk. So as a, as a newer investor, you know, what you can expect is anywhere between the 80 to 85 to 90 percent loan to cost range. Uh, and as you gain more experience, that can decrease slightly. Uh, so what we're going to make sure you hit nail on the head, skin in the game, um, you know, 100% financing, uh, that's, you know, we're not going to get there. Um, but we want to make sure that you have some skin in the game to, you know, keep that deal moving, right? Can you fund the rehab and get that, the draws reimbursed? Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that you're able to keep that deal operating and moving. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, skin in the game is a big thing on, on the um, rehab deals and also acquisitions in general. And just to go do some vocabulary, just in case people like hear that those terms, I want to make sure we understand what they're talking about. So a loan to cost would mean, I'm, I'm going to say what I think it means and correct me if I'm wrong. So if, if I buy a $200,000 property, that's a fixer upper, and I think it could be worth 300,000 afterwards. If I'm a, if I'm on that 15% kind of uh, down payment, or, you know, that's the amount of skin in the game I need to have, then I need to put up 30 grand out on the purchase price of that property. If I'm paying $200,000 for it, and then any rehab above that, 
how would that work? Like the, the so I'm just okay. want to understand how, like the cut, the skin, what that skin in the game means from those terms. Yeah, gladly. So, I mean, you, you had it very, very close. I, I think to kind of add more color loan to cost would be your, let's say you're purchasing it for 200 and doing, or let me backtrack purchasing it for 150 and 50 of rehab. So mm-hmm. your total cost is 200,000. Okay. So we're looking at loan to cost on a total cost basis. So a total cost purchase and rehab cost. So the loan to cost would be up to 85, 90% within that total cost basis. Yeah. So I want people to like, some people think just down payment only. It's like in the investment world, you're thinking about your rehab cost too, which is a big deal. Like the fact that you guys, even as you know, when you say 15% or 85 or 90% loan to cost, you know, that's that if you buy it for 150 and you put 50 in it, you're covering a big portion of the remodel cost. So like, you know, you're having some skin in the game as a new investor, whether that's, you know, from savings you've had down the road where if you had to bring a partner in and the two of you do it together. I mean, there's, there's ways to come up with that amount of money. You're still using a, a good bit of leverage to be able to, to do a remodel like that. No doubt. No doubt. And, and we'll get into the backside of it, but there's a, you know, a lot of different ways to look at a deal and, and make sure that it's, it's good for the investor. And that's what Greg and I really enjoy doing and, you know, making sure that the investor is finding and, and doing the best deal that, that works for them. Cool. Well, I, I want to get real granular with this. And I know at, at risk of, you know, if somebody watches this a year and a half from now, they're going to listen to the terms and say, hey, there's totally different interest rates and things like that. But just to, like, if people are listening to this right now, we're recording it in May of 2022. People might listen to it in June or July. But like, what are the, if, if somebody were to get approved for a loan, let's just get some like real granular kind of details that let's go back with those numbers we just talked about $150,000 property. They have $50,000 remodel cost. And let's assume that the full value is going to be a lot more than that. Let's just say it's a $300,000 property, right? Like, what, what are just some sample uh, interest rates? And, and are there any other terms that are kind of like the key terms that people would want to know about uh, on that kind of loan? Yeah, absolutely. So strictly looking at those numbers. Um, so say you're a brand new investor, you're just getting into investing in real estate, and you come across a distressed property that you're wanting to do some rehab to with a $150,000 as the purchase price, and then you're putting $50,000 into it. So kind of tapping into those different terminologies that we were just talking about for the loan to cost as well as the acquisition. So every single rehab loan is broken down to a particular leverage based on experience as we just discussed. So brand new investor, you can expect 80% coming in right off the bat, a lender will be able to finance 80% of the acquisition, will always fund 100% of the rehab with a blended loan to cost, putting the rehab and the purchase price together of 85%. Now, that's a brand new investor. Um, and I'm, I'm sure whenever investors are get first getting started, listening to a lot of different podcasts, um, every single lender has a loan to after repair value cap, meaning based off whatever that after repair value is, exactly like you just said in the scenario, 300000 that would be a home run of a deal if you're looking mm-hmm. at a property where you're buying it and you're putting total costs of 200000 I mean, you're looking at profit margins on the back end of, of 100000 Now, yeah. most people have probably heard the 70% rule. So if you've heard the 70% rule, that's just basically taking a look at your total loan to cost and comparing that directly with your after repair value. So it truly just comes down to the numbers. But to answer your question for the, the fees, the interest rates, what to expect going into it, Brand new investor, I mean, you can expect anything as of right now, May 26th, 2022. You can expect anything from mid nines to low tens from a percentage standpoint for the interest rate. And then if you're looking at for the origination fee, or most people will hear points on the front end, you can expect anything from two points or 2% to 2.5% um, for the origination fee, which is just the lender's fee for actually getting that deal done and getting it to the closing table. But I would like to say from a leverage as well as ra- uh, rates and terms, they will constantly improve as you gain more experience. Got it. Okay, cool. Just to summarize that. So when people are thinking about short-term loans, you're buying this property, there's a fixer upper and needs a lot of work, you know, getting a conventional loan or something on a big fixer upper property, not going to be typically. So you're having to find money for this fixer upper property somehow, some way. And so you're, there, there's two criteria you got to think about your loan to cost 
and then your loan to value. Both of those are kind of guides you guys use as lenders and really, really any lender. You know, I've made hard money loans and borrowed a lot of hard money or private money. Um, so you, you have this loan to value and loan to cost, and then you have the term. So nine or 10% today. Um, I remember when I first did my first private money deal just with an individual, I paid 10% you know, 2003, 2004, and these things fluctuate, right? I think probably, you know, as interest rates go down lower, I've seen them in the seven, eight percent range, you know, at some, at some point, but the, the point, and I, I want to get your guys take on this too. Like you've seen a lot of investors come through and flip houses and buy fixer upper rental properties. Somebody might be used to getting an owner occupant loan at like 4%, 5%. And here they are hearing nine, 10% for, for investment loan. Is this crazy? Is this, is this something, you know, why would anybody pay that high of interest? on a loan that's going to be an investment. What, what, what's, your, what's your take on that? Why are people doing this? Well, I mean, uh, hey, it's a great question. We get that a lot. Um, you know, why Lima One or why should I go with you guys? Um, I mean, it's simple. Um, number one, I think you hit on it. The bank is probably not going to finance this property. But, I mean, that's the simple, simplest answer. They're not going to finance a property that's distressed, needs a ton of work. But then also, I mean, all the headaches of underwriting that you might face with a conventional lender that, you know, the W-2s, the tax returns, oh, your DTI, whatever, all this sort of stuff. I mean, we're not looking at that. And you're paying a little bit of a premium on rate um, for speed and execution. Um, I mean, there is simple three figures on our side on a rehab deal that it checks the box. Purchase, rehab, and is the ARV good? Boom. If it's good, we're going to close that as long as the borrower is qualifying. So, I mean, it's, you're paying for speed. You're paying for somebody that can get the deal done. And that, you know, this is what we do every day. We focus on those deals. So um, yeah, it's, it looks like a lot, but um, at the end of the day, I mean, I I think that's pretty normal now, uh, but it's, you know, Hey, it's where we are. The thing I would add too is that it, it is normal and it's also, it's a business, like it's a business decision. So you, you pay, you know, as, as a business owner, you pay employees and you pay their fees in order to make a profit. And so you're renting this money at a certain cost and you should be making a profit on the back end. So like if you're doing a flip and fix and flip, if you're not making 50 grand on a $300,000 property, you know, you're not doing it right. Like you, you should be making, you should be building that into your pro forma numbers on the front end. And if you're, if you own a property for six months or three months, and before you go to, to flip it or to, you know, refinance it, then, you know, 10% interest on a $200,000 loan, that's what, 20000 over a year, $10,000 for six months. So five to 10 grand is going to be your interest cost and you have some fees and things up front. But if you, if, you know, you're building that into your, your, pro, your analysis of every single deal. So if you are paying $10,000 in, in cost of your loan, then you should be making some amount of money on the back end. And if you're so skinny on your profits that, you know, five or 10 grand is like the do or do or don't do your deal. Like that's, you're just not doing a good enough deal. You got to find another deal that has more meat on the bone. Yeah. And, and another question that we get all the time, I really kind of want to hit home to is that, Hey, I, in this scenario, let's say you're, you have $400,000 cash. Um, why would I pay or work with you guys when I could buy this property cash and I could rehab it cash? Get that all the time. Well, guess what? You come to us to help scale your business. So you could maybe do one or two properties with the $400,000 cash, all cash, fine. But guess what? We could help you scale by acquiring and rehabbing or burring three, four, maybe five properties with that same amount of cash. So you come to us to help leverage your money in a smart way um, to help grow your business. Yep, exactly. Love it. All right, cool. So we've kind of touched on maybe this idea of a flip. You know, somebody's got a flip and they're turning it over. Very close to that, though, in the short term world, which is, I think, probably the most interesting program for the most number of people that are that probably listening to this is you find a fixer upper property, you fix it up, you get it rented out, and then you want to hold it. You want to keep it for the long run. And my friend Brandon Turner over at Bigger Pockets coined a term. People have been doing these deals forever, but buy, rent, re- remodel, rent, refinance, repeat. So I can't, <laughs> can't remember all that. Um, but let's talk about what you guys do. You have a, 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 a rent. Uh, fix it up and then rent program. And I think it's really interesting how it's kind of a combination of short-term loan, and then you eventually can have a long-term loan. So explain to me how that works. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have that low pro loan program. It's called our fixed to rent loan program or the Burr loan program um, that is actually set up exactly for those types of investors that are going in, uh, purchasing those properties, renovating them, refinancing and uh, repeating. So the way we have it set up is we have a short term fix and flip loan, and it's the same exact terms, rates and terms from um, whether you were going to sell it or whether you were going to refinance it on the back end. But essentially what we do is we provide incentive to the borrowers or the investors to come back and say, hey, I'm ready to refinance this property. Let's get rolling. And the very first question that every single investor asks is, what LTV can you guys refinance out whenever I come back for a cash out? And what are your particular seasoning requirements in order to be able to refinance at the maximum leverage based off those particular requirements? And what we have done and put in place at Lima One is we will completely waive the seasoning period. So as fast as your crews or as fast as you're able to work and complete that renovation, I know it's extremely aggressive to say, but if it's two weeks, three weeks, you could still come back and get a cash out refinance at max leverage. And that's what everybody is looking for right now, whether that comes down to scaling as fast as possible and really getting that Burr program rolling to where you, and you might start off January of 2023 and you might be working on two Burr properties. You finish those renovations relatively quickly and you're gonna see those profits and those properties start to compound because you can move as fast as you would like to. Now, Another incentive that we have within our fixed rent loan program, not only waiving the, waiving the seasoning period so you can come back as fast as you would like to, we will also give you a discount on the origination fee. So discount on the origination fee for the refinance transaction. Say you come back and standard what you're looking at for a refinance, depending upon the loan amount, starts off at 1.75 for the origination fee. Now, if you have that short-term loan with us and you come back for that refinance, say a month, two months, three months later, whenever you're done with the work, we will actually give you a discount on the origination fee, which is saving you and allowing your money to work better for you and actually go further so that you can continue to invest in more properties. So that's one part of the process, but without having to, to go get a totally separate company to do a totally separate loan, you're just, you know that as soon as this gets done, whether it's two weeks or six months, you can come back and refinance it. And you mentioned the, the term cash out refinance. So let's, let's yes. talk about what, 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 what does that mean? And what does this second loan look like in terms of a loan to value ratio? Yeah, absolutely. So what we can do is actually just go exactly off of the, the previous example that we talked about, say purchasing a property for 150,000 and you're putting $50,000 worth of rehab into that property with an expected after repair value of $300,000. You already hit the nail on the head earlier whenever we're saying, okay, if you're expecting an 85% blended loan to cost, then your down payment, excluding closing fees, you're going to be expecting around $30,000 for the initial short-term loan. Now, on the back end, whenever you come back for a cash-out refinance, a cash-out refinance is strictly based off the appraised value of that property after the renovation is completed. So you hear ARV a lot. That's after repair value. So bringing up or bringing that property up to that market value based off the renovations that you have completed. And whenever you go to cash out refinance, you are essentially pulling out of that property, which you now have an equity because you just forced that equity by increasing the value of it. You're converting that equity that you have in that property to cash. You're cashing out the equity that you have in that property to put it in a different word. So Whenever you're actually going to refinance, say off that 300,000, what we could do is being that we can offer max leverage within our fixed to, fixed to rent loan program at an ARV of $300,000, you already know in the back of your mind that you, are, you came out of pocket three or 30,000 on the original acquisition in that rehab loan. So running the numbers real quick right here, our maximum LTV for a cash out refinance is 80% LTV. Now that's per particular qualifications, but we can get into that later whenever we're talking about the rental side of things. Best, um, best case, like best case, 80%. It, exactly. again, again, if you have other things that aren't, aren't qualifying as well, you might be down in the 75% or, or so or, or lower. Right? Exactly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so we could touch on that whenever we're talking more specifically about uh, rental and getting real granular with those details. But yeah. based off a $300,000 after repair value, 
your loan to value is the size of your loan based off the value of that property. So 80% LTV for a $300,000 property is going to be $240,000. Now, keep in mind what on the original short-term loan, 85% of the $200,000 total cost, you're sitting at $170,000. So your payoff for the loan is going to be that $170,000 for the short term. Based off the ARV of $300,000, 80% LTV, your new loan is $240,000. So you're seeing a $70,000 difference right there, which you can look at that as your profit or the equity that you're going to have and the amount that you're going to be able to cash out refinance. Okay. So if strictly looking at 240 minus 170, just the payoff versus how much you're cashing out, that gives you a difference of that $70,000. And then once you include the, the closing costs, as well as um, interest reserve escrow, I mean, we can, we can get down in the details once again mm -hmm. later, but you're looking at a variance of $70,000 of profit in that moment. Yeah. And so cash out refinance is a, are a cool concept. When people first hear about it, they're like, what, how did that work? And I've, I've sort of given people a home run scenario here, like the $300,000 <laughs> and you buy it for 150. I mean, that's a, I, I've done deals like that in the past, but that's a really good deal. But just, I want people to like really let absorb this because as a long-term investor who's buying and holding, this is a really key transition going from your short-term kind of stabilization period, fixing it up to the time when you buy a property or when you refinance it, and now you're able to hold it for a long period of time, that, that transition is really important. And, and what, just go back to the numbers Greg just talked about, like even if you up to about $240,000, if you, if, you, if you know you can get an 80% loan on the back end, you're, if your goal is to have most of your cash pulled back out, then your purchase plus your remodel costs, as long as in your, any of your financing costs, as long as it's below 240,000 bucks, you as an investor could recycle your upfront cash. You could, you could pull your cash back out and, and then go do it again. And that's the beauty of the, re, of the Burr strategy for new investors or people who are growing and scaling is that, that, that short-term cash you have is very valuable and you want to be able to do more deals with it when you're growing. And so this, that's, the, that's the, the really important value of this tool is that whether it's 75% or 80%, every time I did a rental property early on, I would look at that number and say, I just want to make sure if I can, a really good deal would be something I could buy at 70, 75%, maybe 80% minus all my costs so that I could pull all my costs back out on the back end. That was like the key ingredient for me for growing with not much capital, you know, because you had investors who would be able to do this on the back end. So just want to let that sink in for people, you know, the value of that, that second refinance. And it, it goes a long way. I mean, you can take, as Greg mentioned, that 70000 you said it, roll it into the next deal. Guess what? You got the down payment and the money to do maybe two now instead of one. So, and that's really how you scale from doing one or two a year to three, four, five, or even to one a month. So, I mean, that's, it. you know, it's a slow game. And in, in real estate, you really want to make careful and strategic moves um, and, and do it the right way because, you know, I've seen the, the negative sides of it. It's not all just take 80% and you're getting 70K and getting that wire and you're good. Yeah, you got, you got to, there's a lot of details below the surface. And we're going to give some, a couple of case studies here in a second where we go into some more, some more of those details to show you how that works. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I, I want to mention one more thing. One of the bigger risks I see with the burst strategy, like I, I like the burst strategy. I think it's great. It sometimes gets portrayed as like the end all be all of everything. And I think one of the things this that I like about your program, that it takes one of the big risks away that if you do a short-term loan, if you get a hard money loan that has a six month or a 12 month or a 14 month balloon on it, where you got to pay all your money back in those 14 months, the biggest risk I see as an investor where I've seen people holding the, the bag and get in trouble and down markets is not having the takeout money ready ahead of time. Like that's the whole key. Like once you get to the takeout money and you got a 30 year loan or a 10 year loan, you, you got some time. You can breathe. You can relax. You can rent that. Even if you had a negative cash flow in a great re in a recession or something, that's that's better than having to pay two hundred thousand dollars all at one time on three properties. Like that'll sink you. Like that's that's what puts people out of business. So I just I, you know from a risk management standpoint, even you know knowing that you have that second loan ready with a company that can close it and can knock it out is is really important because if you got stuck and you owed a, a lender money on three loans or two loans and you couldn't pay it back, 
for whatever reason, because your you know, credit changed or something happened or, or whatever, that's, that's, that's the, the time when you got to really pay attention. So, um, you know, it's, it's an advantage. You can pull money out, cash out, refinance, but it's also a risk mitigation thing to think about. No, that's, yeah, it's amazing. It's a great point. And, and, you know, to Greg's point, um, the way that you can help mitigate that risk as a borrower is you, like you said, you have the takeout, but with this option is obviously we have to make sure that you're still qualifying. So that's, I mean, that's, I want to make sure that that's known, but you know, there, there's certainty in value on the takeout as long as all work has been done. So um, like Greg said, is a big advantage to waive the seasoning requirement because some lenders are at three month seasoning requirements. Some are at six, it varies, but waiving the seasoning requirement is a huge deal. And we're going to do what um, some people would call a 1004 D um, which is, you know, 1004. I'm just going to hit on that is that's an appraisal from a single family property. And then a 1004 D is a completion report verifying on the back end for this long-term debt that all work has been done. So this $50,000 budget you said you were going to do, we're sending that original appraiser out there and verifying the market hasn't changed. And then also verifying that all work was done. Um, and as long as you do what you said you were going to do, all the boxes are checked and you're good to go there value-wise. Great. Well, I, in just a minute, I want to get into some of the details of interest rates and more details about rental loans on the back end. But before we do that transition, I want to stay here with the Burr strategy, buying re remodel properties, fixing them up and getting takeout loans. From your experience, you guys are closing loans all the time. Like, Can you think of any examples or maybe any red flags or any mistakes, like just some real world scenarios you've seen that might be helpful for people listening to this, just to keep in mind, maybe, maybe it's something that is keeping people from getting their burr loans in the front end, or maybe it's some mistakes people have made. Just curious if you have some things that come to mind for you. Yeah. I, um, a lot of things really, um, just a couple high level things and I can let Greg piggyback. I mean, it, from start to finish, you want to make sure that you're with a solid contractor um, and you vet out contractors multiple um, because that budget could change. Um, and, the, and the budget is a key thing to this project. Um, and then really, you want to make sure that your after repair value is in line with what you're thinking or in the market is thinking as well. But one of the biggest things that I see all the time is um, let's go back to this 300K ARV. Um, in some places, it might be hard, as we know um, from bigger pockets, brand turn of the 1% rule. Um, it's hard to sometimes find a $3,000 a month rental. Um, and as a lender for takeout debt, we look at we, underwriting through a market rent versus what is stably leased. So it's obviously better for us as a lender to see that your property is leased. Um, now, we look at the lesser of that. So, you know, even if you're leasing it for 3,500 and the market calls for 25, hey, that's great that you're doing that, but we're gonna look at underwriting it from a, we'll get into this later about DSCR, but looking at it from a debt coverage perspective of the lower. So wanna make sure that, you know, when you're looking at, you know, your underwriting and performa of what is market rent, because we have to all look at that to make sure that, you know, the numbers are in line. So just like in a, in a lot of people are familiar with appraisals when they're getting their home or any other loan, but not only is there appraisal on the value, but you guys look really closely, especially on the rental at the, the rent and how much that's going to cover your debts. And so that we're, we're, we can give them a sneak pre preview, like debt coverage ratio is such an important part of these loans, because you as a lender, your risk is that if you got stuck with this property, you want to make sure that the, the debt is, is covered and yeah. it has some cushion, right? And so, so do we as investors, like investors need it. So that's another good thing that you're requiring people to look at the worst case scenario. But what you're saying is if you got some sucker to rent the property for 3,500 bucks, but really the rent was 2,500 bucks for some, for some reason or whatever you know, the case might be, you've got to know that you, you guys are going to be looking at the market rent. And if there's a difference there, you're going to go with the one that's a lower amount. Yep. That's exactly right. Okay. Anything else come to mind for you guys? Yeah. So I just like to, to touch on one thing whenever we're looking at appraisal values of these particular properties. So Christian touched on it a little bit. The main three things that we're looking for to determine whether it is a, a good property to actually go in and do some renovation work to would be how much are you purchasing it for? How much 
money are you putting into it or how much rehab funds are you putting into that particular property and what is the expected after repair value now those are really the main things that it comes down to now say you find a property and it's actually listed on the mls and you're saying okay well the numbers make sense for this deal at that at this particular purchase price but considering the way that the the current market is with uh, with real estate where there's a difference between the market value of a property and how much somebody is willing to pay for the property. That does not necessarily mean that is actually what the property is valued at. So whenever you're taking a look at the actual acquisition price or the purchase price of that given property, keeping in mind, okay, yeah, so I'm running the numbers on these 150, 500, ARV 300. Say you go under contract for that property for 150,000, what you're gonna expect is, or what you would want to do is do your due diligence on the front end to say, okay, if this is this particular property, this is how many bedroom, baths, square footage, everything involved, trying to find those particular sales comps within that specific market and doing all of your due diligence on the front end. So when they were, whenever we get the appraisal back, if it comes back to where the as is value of that property is 120,000, even though you're under contract and you're purchasing the property for 150, you have to make up the difference. So same exact thing for the market market rent versus what the, the property is actually leased for will take the lesser thereof. So we're always as a lender going back to to mitigate the risk side of things, always going back to what is the current market data for that particular property and not the number, not specifically the numbers of that exact deal and how much you're uh, you're purchasing the property for. Same thing for the ARV. I just want that to be uh, abundantly clear so you don't get blindsided by an appraisal. <laughs> Got it. So you, you've seen investors come out and on either the rent or the appraisal where they're thinking that they're thinking one thing they had wished for, hopeful thinking that the value is going to be this or they paid this, but then the actual appraisal comes in less and they need to put more skin in the game. They need to more have more cash. Got it. And that's also important on the takeout loan. Like, you know, we, we gave a really rosy scenario. All right, this thing, we think this thing's going to be worth 300,000. Prices are going up 20% per year. And, you know, we know these things going to be, and then it goes flat or even the price goes down a little bit. You know, you need to be ready for that. You, you need to have some conservative comps on the back end and, and have a prep. I always say like in business in general, like just be prepared, have like a plan A, plan B, plan C. Like if you can't live with plan C, then don't even do the deal. Like you, you shouldn't do a deal based on plan A. Um, right. You want to try to go for plan A, like, you know, do really well in the deal, but you can survive by being pessimistic a little bit as an investor. Don't be so rosy eyed and put your rose colored glasses on that you think everything's going to be great. You got to plan for that worst case scenario, have some backup reserves some backup cash. That's, that's how you get through these remodel deals are really you know, there's always surprises, right? There's always surprises on the remodel cost, on the, the resale value. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty there, which is why we make money in the in, in the end, right? We make money because we're willing to take that risk. But uh, this is really good advice to be prepared for the, the different uh, appraisal values and also maybe rent comps. Make sure, and I just the like practical tip, I want to see what you guys think, what other investors are doing. I like to have my real estate agent who's an experienced real estate agent on the front end, like validate my own numbers. Like I run my own comps and look at that too, but like I have my real estate agent help me with after repair values and have a really good comparable market analysis. Maybe people use appraisers too. I like my real estate agent because I feel like they're on the ground listing a lot of houses. Uh, but then also my property manager, I'm really in close touch with them for, you know, give me the rent comps that this property can have top end, lower end. And then, and then if you have that data, then it's something you can share and you can know, you can have validate, hey, here's what the, the data is in the market is current, it's up to date. Um, you, have, you guys, what do you guys see investors doing just to make sure they avoid some of these uh, problems on the back end? I mean, I don't think you could have said it any better. Uh, I mean, that's, that's exactly the route to go um, because I think even if you just did the data yourself, um, that's fine and dandy, but you want to make sure that somebody else is agreeing with you you know, or somebody else in the market to see, because we also deal with a lot of investors that are out of state. So, you know, they have to have that realtor that's boots on the ground and the property management company or the GC. So, I mean, really, you got to make sure that what you're underwriting, your performance is saying is, is in line with what's actually happening in the market. Got it. Okay. So let's, let's transition a little bit. We've talked about this, the um, fix up and then rent pro product, which is a really important piece of your tool in your toolbox as a real estate investor. Let's talk about that back end though, whether 
whether you're fixing it up and renting it or whether you just buy a turnkey rental, you find a rental property that's already fixed up, is already rented out or ready to rent out. There's this long-term rental mortgage, which I just have to say, like, because I'm going to kind of give my own, you know, 20 year history away here. When I, when I first started, you know, getting an investor loan, that's a 30 year loan, other than that conventional kind of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac product, which cuts off at maybe four to 10 loans, you know, depending on your situation. Like the fact that you can get 30 year fixed financing as an investor and, or get 10 year, you know, adjustable rate kind of mortgages, that's a big positive change as an investor. It's one of the reasons I reached out to Lima One and have been trying to partner with you on this is because I really love the idea. And I think it's really important that investors can get long-term mortgages and, and reduce their risk by doing that. So let's talk a little bit. Can you guys educate me and the listeners on what this, what these long-term investor rental mortgage products look like, what the criteria are, and just kind of give some highlights on it. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever you are in the uh, the private lending space or the industry side of the, the real estate investing, one thing that we touched on and have touched on a good bit is your actual skin in the game as the investor. So at the end of the day, and I mean, we all saw it, everything that went on this year with the real estate market, um, the more skin you have in the game all comes down to the LTV. We touched on it for the cash out refinance, but just more on the acquisition and the purchase side of things. So we can go up to 80% LTV on an actual um, acquisition or a purchase. Now, once again, that's always per qualifications whenever we get into to debt coverage and what those particular requirements are looking like. But th what I want to get out there that a lot of people don't necessarily understand is whenever they first start investing in real estate is the more skin you have in the game, the more protected you are in that particular investment. So whenever you're dealing with a, a volatile real estate market, then there's a lot of concerns is like, okay, well, am, am I protected in this? Um, I just took out max leverage and I continue to do that on every single property that I have, but you are more protected um, whenever you have a lot, or I don't wanna say a lot more, but more skin in the game. But strictly looking at the, the high level of long-term debt options that we have and kind of just the different guidelines and requirements um, in order to qualify for those particular loans. So all 30 year, debt options. We have the standard 30 year fixed, which is, uh, which is huge because that did not used to be able to be a, an investor style type loan. Now these are DSCR style loan options, which means that's the debt service coverage ratio that we were talking about earlier to where we don't need to take a look at the W2s, the tax statements. We're strictly looking at the performance of the property and what that's going to look like on a month to month basis. So Right, can I can I can I interrupt you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. At so any time. Let, let's pause on the DSCR. So that if somebody's never heard that term before, you know, let, let's talk about you know what the, the mechanics of that. Now I'm, I'm going to say what I think it is, and you correct me if I'm wrong here. So you have a, you have a property that rents. Let's say it rents four thousand bucks per month, and you take all of your expenses, your taxes, your insurance, your management, your maintenance, and whatever's left over is your net operating income. So if people watch my YouTube channel, they know I go to that number and do that formula all the time. But you have that what's let, that property is producing a certain amount of rent after expenses, and a debt coverage debt service coverage ratio means you need to have a certain cushion there. So like you can't just have the debt service be the same as what your net operating income is. You need to have some kind of cushion there, typically twenty percent, twenty five percent, if I'm if I remember that right. So like you need to have a a, a margin there between what your income is and what your cut your debt is and that's your that's your cash flow as well that's your positive cash flows is that is that kind of the, the core criteria we're talking about here exactly um, you know as a as a asset based lender like you said we don't want to write a loan where your payment is $1000 a month pity and then you're bringing in $1000 a month that's not an investment <laughs> So, um, you know, it, we look at it on a 1.2x basis. So um, if you're you know, making sure that you're getting that margin of cash flow or that net operating income, like you mentioned. So it, that's what we look at and making sure the deal qualifies. So as Greg mentioned, you know, we do have the max LTVs, but this is kind of goes back to the market rent stuff. We want to make sure that we're writing a loan where at that certain LTV that you have a minimum debt service coverage ratio of a 1.2x. So when you see lower LTVs or, you know, hey, the max LTV is this, that's probably the reason why, because we want to write that loan to where you're still making a certain 
you know, that 20% cash flow each month. So if you have a debt payment of a thousand bucks, you need to have a net operating income of about 1200 bucks. That could be a $200 cash flow on your end. And what I'm hearing is like the max potential loan to value could be 80%, but it might be that in order to meet that debt coverage service ratio, it might be that a 70% loan is the best you can do in order to meet that coverage. So there's a, it's kind of like a, I don't know what you call it, like a moving target or like there's a, several criteria that all come together at once. And you as an investor, you can run your numbers on this. Like every spreadsheet I've used and share with my audience, you know, you can, there is a debt service coverage ratio line on spreadsheets that I have. And so it's, it's a really important number to know as, a, as an investor yourself. But what I'm also hearing is this is a really important number for lenders because they ultimately, the risk they have is that they become, they take your place and they become an investor too. So they have to do the same thing. They got to think about this as a, is this a good deal? Is this not a good deal? And this is kind of interesting. Let's talk maybe a, a point to step aside here. You know, the market interest rates have changed, right? We've four or five months ago, interest rates were, were lower. Now they're going up. And this is a concern I've have talked to a lot of investors about like, hey, if interest rates are 6% or 7%, that directly affects my debt service coverage ratio. So it is something investors are going to have to watch out for on making sure they buy properties that have a certain cash flow. They might have to make lower offers on properties to make this work. I, just, I think that's, a, that's an interesting dynamic. I don't know if you guys are seeing any kind of real-time adjustments there for other investors. Yeah, it's, um, it's obviously a moving target and you know, we, it changes day to day or hourly hour by hour. So, you know, what, what we're seeing a lot is I think you've really got to be cognizant of your performance and your underwriting, um, especially for your takeout. I think you've really got to increase that takeout by one to 2% higher than what you thought it would be. Um, and you've really got to be conservative with those calculations. And, and you know, it, it is an elephant in the room of the higher interest rates. But, you know, I think we were all used to the COVID lower rates and we're really, if you kind of look at a chart, we're almost back to where we were pre-COVID in around 2019. And is in this market as, um, you know, with these private money loans, you know, just kind of pulling back a layer, you know, we um, deal with a lot with secondary market people. We deal with a lot with, you know, some lenders sell loans or balance sheet. You know, there is a cost to originate loans. So, you know, we have to make sure that we are smart on our side with our money. And, you know, as everything changes, there's, there's costs that go along with that. Yeah. Yeah. This will be a, to be continued conversation, right? I mean, who knows, you know, three yeah. months from now, when people are listening to this, it might be totally different, but you know, you, no matter what market we're in, you know, when I first started in 2003 and four interest rates were about where they are now, they went down and they had a continual down slope. I talk to people like the old timers in the real estate business, you know, the, and learn a lot from them. But they 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 tell stories about the nineteen early nineteen eighties, late seventies when FHA rates were eighteen percent, you know. So, you know, it, it, but guess what? In every market, investors were making money and buying properties. So just keep that in mind. You know, people who are just getting in the business, you might like, you know, say, "Oh, run for the hills." Interest rates were seven percent. Really? Okay. Well, let's let's think about that. Let's let's figure out a way to make it work and look at the opportunity. How can I make deals work? How can I make it make sense? But you can't, this, this is like physics or science, right? You can't change the fact that you have to have a debt covered, service coverage ratio that works, whether you're talking to Lima One or whoever you're talking to, this is a, a fact of life. So we as investors just have to figure out a way to make that work. So good, good conversation. We can keep that going. Wanna, just like we did on the fix and flip loans, but we have a little bit more time here. Talk, let's talk about this example you know, terms and rates that um, you might have to have. We, we talked about 30-year loans. Let's also compare that to like 10-year uh, loans and five-year loans because there's other options out there. What if today in May 2022, what would, might an interest rate look like for an investor on one of those loans? Yeah, um, that's really good. You know, I'll kind of get into different options also. Um, you know, I think right now, good credit, 700 plus credit, 740 plus credit. You know, you're looking higher LTVs probably in the high six to low sevens, depending upon which uh, loan option. So, um, you know, I, I know you mentioned some arms and I kind of want to hit on that. Um, we have a five, one arm, a 10, one arm, um, a five year interest, only 25 year arm. And then the 30 year fixed Greg mentioned. Now, for those that don't know what an arm is, uh, that stands for an adjustable rate mortgage. So that means in the five and 10 year term, respectively, that's going to be a fixed initial rate for five years and 10 years. Now, something that some people don't need to be shocked about when they see 
these types of loans in the private money space is there are prepayment penalties. Um, not, you know, with owner occupied loans, you more than likely don't have those. But um, with prepayment penalties, the standard would be probably five years um, across the board. Now, kind of looking at it from a business perspective, you know, so you've got your five one arm that has the lowest rate of all the options. And, but also you have the highest risk tolerance in terms of your rate will adjust after that prepayment penalty. And that adjusts semi-annually, so twice a year. And you're also having the 10-1 arm that adjusts after 10 years. And you've got that five-year gap where there's no prepayment penalty. So, you know, and then you have the 30-year fix, which is fixed for 30 years. So the way that I would, I can't really advise people, but I would say to people from a business perspective, you know, if you are not sure if you want to hold it long-term, if you know you're holding it more than five years, hey, that 10-1 arm is a good option because it gives you five years of no prepayment to kind of figure out what to do. If you want to lock it in for 30 years, you can still do that. That's an option. But if you know you might sell in, in three, four, five years, the 5-1 arm is also a good option. So, and that's the beauty of it. We're flexible. We can change two, a day or two before closing option-wise. So it, it's there's a lot of different options. Yeah, I love that those options are there. And I, I want to give people some perspective too. Like when when I mentioned earlier that these types of loans weren't available when I was really growing and kind of scaling my own business, the option I had from a bank perspective was going to the local bank, getting a commercial loan, which was like a 15 or 20 year amortization with not a five-year arm, a five-year balloon. Like they, you got to pay the entire thing off. So I, I want to just make sure that's a, that's a correct dis distinction here that you know, when I went to the commercial bank and had a loan in five years, whatever I owed was 150,000 bucks, I've got to pay that entire amount back. And they might kind of say, oh yeah, you can refinance at that point, whatever. But I saw tons and tons of people go out of business in 2008, nine and 10, because they couldn't afford to pay off their 10 loan balloons that came due. And where are you going to get a million and a half bucks in the great recession when nobody's loaning you money? Um, an arm on the other hand, like I, I like an arm as kind of a backup plan to a 30 year loan, or maybe even a, a better plan in some cases, because you get to that five-year point, you get to that 10-year point, you don't have to pay the entire amount back. It's just that the payment changes, right? Every every six months, it can go. So if the interest rates are going up, your payment will go up. But even in that case, like that's not positive, but you can probably stomach that, right? You got that good cushion there. Your rents have probably gone up. You could fund some negative cash flow for a little bit if you needed to. Whereas a balloon is a serious thing. Like that's where people go out of business because you can't, if you get, you can't come up with the money, the lender could foreclose on it. And, and so I just want to bring that distinction up. Like, you know, we're always in risk mitigation mode as banks, but also as investors and the biggest risk in the entire business that I've seen, the only, only the main way I've seen people go out of business is not being able to pay their lender. I haven't seen, I've, you know, all the other stuff that people worry about is yes, it's a worry, but it's like very minuscule compared to not getting good financing. So I just, I just want to like highlight the importance of this. You know, if you, in some, some cases, if you're very risk averse, you might go the Dave Ramsey model and just pay cash for everything, right? That's like the one extreme. If you're pretty risk averse, you might want to lock in 30 year loans and say, all right, I don't, I don't want to worry about that. But, you know, maybe a little bit more aggressive, but also pretty smart way are uh, arms, you know, like a 10 year arm, 10 years can get you through a lot of ups and downs of the market. And so I feel pretty comfortable doing that. And so I know that's, that's just, these are good options for you all to look at. You have to balance like interest rates a little bit lower on the arms versus the 30 years, but it's good to know that those are available for you. All right. There's my little diatribe there. Um, so same question. I have you just to wrap up here with the, with the long-term loans, any red flags, any big mistakes you are seeing people make, whether it's on a purchase re a rental loan or a refinance rental loan that you should, that people should keep in mind. So really the biggest red flags that we're going to see are that just comes straight down to the market rent and not necessarily just strictly looking at the exact amount of rent that the property is currently leased for, but it kind of just doing your due diligence, talking with your property management companies, talking with the real estate agent, like you talked or spoke to earlier, and really just making sure that the, your, the data that you have whenever you go to move forward with a, a refinance or an acquisition actually line up. Now, the biggest thing that I do see as well, or that we all see whenever we're dealing with investors is keeping in mind whenever you go to purchase a property or whenever you go to refinance a property, don't just strictly look at the previous year's taxes because that actual property tax value is based off the 
previous time that that property was assessed. So every single time, whenever you go to move forward, hence the appraisal, a property will get reassessed every single time from a value standpoint. And those property taxes are based strictly off of that new value. And that is a lot of times whenever we see, um, whenever we're dealing with investors is a particular red flag because it's just strictly looking at the historic property taxes and underestimating truly what that exact amount of tax is going to be at the end of the year, which in the end affects your cash flow, affects your debt service coverage ratio to where preliminary numbers we're looking at it. Yeah, we can do 75% LTV. And then we get further down the line of underwriting and we actually have the finalized figures for taxes, insurance, everything of that nature. And you're at the end of the, or at the, uh, right before closing, you're looking at it, you're like, well, why is my LTV like 65%? We originally agreed upon 75. That all goes down to the due diligence of making sure those numbers and the data that you're looking at is actually accurate for the market. But keeping in mind the reassessment of the property value, that, that is the biggest red flag. I cannot echo that enough. <laughs> I mean, that's, you, it, even you know, if we're looking at a deal personally, you have to understand and even over assess what property tax could be because you never know what that could jump to. Um, and, and, and in some cases, if, if it's a burr or a rental, you know, that may make more sense to sell or may not be good at, be a good acquisition property taxes. That is a huge thing. Yeah. Glad you guys brought this up. I mean, I've seen some examples of this where like you buy a property from somebody who's lived in that property for 20 years, 30 years, and, you know, they have the very low, you know, they haven't jumped their assessment up. They fought the assessment and, you know, objected to it. They, and then their assessment before was a hundred thousand and you're buying for 300,000. So not only in South Carolina, every state has a little bit different ways they tax properties but in South Carolina, for example, that your property tax value go up to 300,000. So now it's going to be like three times more on the, on the assessment. And then also though, you as an investor in South Carolina pay a higher tax rate than owner occupants do. So I've seen like my house that I live in, I pay a thousand bucks or so for owner occupant taxes. If I were to rent this property out and be a landlord, it'd be 3,500 bucks, 3,000 bucks with the exact same assessment. So that, that just shows you like, it can be a massive difference. That's why these guys are pointing this out. And I would just add on, not only taxes are one of the big gotchas, but missing out on all your other expenses, you know, your insurance, your, your other costs. Are there any costs that you guys don't include in that debt service coverage ratio? Because I know some, some of them are kind of, you know, up to interpretation. Like, so what, what are the ones that you do include when you figure out what that net operating income is? Yeah. So uh, on our side, we're really just looking at it from a, a pity standpoint. So that stands for principal interest taxes and insurance over your rental income. Now, as an investor, you also have to um, underwrite or for your performa look at you know, a vacancy, maintenance, reserves, all of that. Um, so you know, your 1.2 with a pity could be pretty skinny looking at the true performa. So all we look at is the, um, you know, the pity, but um, as an investor, you have to be a little bit more cognizant to what if the renter leaves? Um, what if HVAC goes out, all, all sorts of things could happen. All right. I'm glad you mentioned that. So, so in reality, like if, if people underwrote how I would recommend it, where they actually have enough cash flow after paying all their expenses, they might be more like at a 1.4, 1.5, even a two, you know, I've seen you know, really, yeah. really good cash flow deals. You know, yeah. th those are the, those are your home run cash flow deals, or maybe you put more money down. You know, like we bought a, a big commercial property or multi-unit property one time, and we put 50% down on a property because we just weren't interested in having a lot of leverage and our, debt service coverage ratio is off the charts, right? It was really, really good. So that, you know, there's all sorts of different ways you can approach this. And I'm glad y'all mentioned earlier, um, Greg, I didn't get to follow up on that, but like your strategy as an investor is important here. Like, you know, some people try to max out their leverage on every single deal. And there's a time and place for that, right? When you're growing and, but it, that don't, you don't need to do that your entire career. In fact, a big part of what I try to teach people here on the, on the podcast and in my book is that at some point, you know, you might want to shift gears and thinking about having less debt and even paying your debt all off, you know, at some point. So it's, you know, this is a, debt is a wonderful tool. And this whole conversation has been about a very specific type of mortgage debt using investor mortgages. Lima One is, and you guys, what you're doing is, is very focused on investors and very oriented towards that. And so this is just a tool y'all need to learn. If you're listening to this, um, this is something you want to become an expert on. You want to pick the brain of the lenders who you're, you're using. And I, as, as a wrap up, guys, I want to give you a chance to hand off you know, how to stay in touch with you. 
But I want to, one final tip of, of advice. So people are listening to this. They might be buying rental properties to fix up and rent. They might be flipping houses. They might be buying turnkey rentals. I just want to, you got, you see a lot of investors come through your off through your desk and they're doing loans. Can you give maybe just a, a snapshot of the people who are successfully doing loans with you, who are like your best customers, who are really knocking it out of the park, doing loans well? Do you have any, maybe any final tips on what those people are doing right that some of the listeners here can, can emulate and copy? Well, uh, I don't want to steal Greg's thunder, but I think we would agree on this, that you have to build a team you trust. Um, and that starts really just, with your, even your business partner, um, and that the whole team would really include um, a realtor, you know, making sure that realtor understands investing, um, making sure that you vet out good property management companies, um, and then a contract, you know, how many crews do they have, all that sort of stuff. You want to, those are the three, three biggest things that if you can really vet out and have control over to make sure that it's a solid group, I mean, you can really succeed and trust people to, you know, take your business to the next level. So, so Greg's going to agree with that one, huh? I, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, so just whenever we're specifically looking at building out your team and really just getting it started and investing in real estate, everybody's first question is, well, how, how do I build out my team? Especially whenever you're dealing with a lot of different investors right now that are investing out of state and they aren't there, boots on the ground. So they have to rely on what other people are saying while they're building out their team. So um, Christian touched on it a little bit. You touched on it earlier, strictly coming down to the property management company. So if you look at vetting out the property management companies, and I mean, it could be something as simple as hopping on bigger pockets saying, hey, I'm investing in this particular market. Does anybody know any trustworthy or reliable property management companies? Um, I always say reach out to a property management company first because they are already working with particular real estate agents that have experience with investors. They also are already working with contractors that are trustworthy and that they know will get out there in a particular time period that is acceptable. Um, so they'll get out to the property and handle any issues that may come up, repairs, maintenance. The property management companies have all of the contacts to build out your team. So that would that would be my, uh, my tip. And the only thing to add is reaching out to them because they already have a team within that you can tap into. You know what I love, guys? We've come first full circle here with the Clemson football team and partnering up with your, your best friends from your football team. Like, this is a team sport. I always tell people that, that like, there's a lot of analogies with sports and real estate investing because you, you might be the star of the team. You might be the, the quarterback or the, you know, whatever, linebacker or kicker, you know, whatever. But it, the people around you are, are going to make you look good. Like, if you're, you could be all, you could be an All American, but if you're, your property manager is no good, or if your your lender is no good, um, you got no chance. So I, lo I love that advice. Love this conversation. Really appreciate you guys and the time you, you've put in today. My, my whole goal here is just lending is such a key piece of the formula is, is really important for, you know, for all of our, us as investors. And I've partnered up with Lima One Capital because I think this is having tool, tools and not just educating you about it is really important. So if y'all are interested in, in, following up with Lima One, I'm going to have links below in the video description, the show notes, so y'all can, you know, put, put your information in, get a call back from these guys. And I actually, because I'm an affiliate partner, I'm just trying to get the word out about what you guys are doing. And I also have a rebate that I do. Like after you close a loan, if you tell them that you were with Coach Carson, I gave a $250 rebate just out of my affiliate partnership portion as well. So just want to let people know that. And I want people, I know people are going to hear you guys and want to work with you probably as well. So um, can you talk about how if they did want to do a loan with you guys or get in touch with your team? How, how can they do that? I'll also put links to all whatever you say in the show description and the video description as well. Yeah, we will, um, you know, give you our emails. Um, and we have a team email that we both uh, work through. Um, that would be C A N D G at Lima one. So that's C and G at Lima one.com. Um, and we'll share both of our phone numbers with you. Um, and you know, make sure you can put those in the video description, but, um, you know, or follow us on Instagram, uh, close with C and G and happy to connect either way. And people can reach out to me and I'll have all your contact information as well. So if people just reach out on my, my website as well. And they just say, Hey, I want to get in touch with Christian and Greg, I can put you in touch and 
they will take care of you from there. But guys, thanks a lot. It's been really fun chatting with you. Hope we can do this again and best of luck with you all and, and everything you got going on. Yeah. Thanks again for having us. Uh, it's been really enjoyable and I uh, hope everybody enjoys the show. Yeah. Excellent guys. Take care. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this interview and this deep dive on investment mortgages. If you like this episode, please join me again next week for a new episode where I'm going to be interviewing author Grant Sabatier. He wrote the book Financial Freedom, and we talk about that and more, the big picture of financial independence, going beyond financial independence, and why are we doing this in the first place, and lots of practical strategies that he learned in achieving financial independence very early in life. So join me again for the next podcast with Grant Sabatier. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that will help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I have not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.